they put you into Google Maps, they drive for half an hour, they get cut off in traffic and someone's flipping them the bird, they find a parking spot, they make it in the doors on time for the one of the four yoga classes that you have. Like, holy shit. They don't need to say anything to you. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Dharma Talk. I'm your host, Henry Winslow, and this is episode number 30, big three zero, with my guest, Josh Biro, this week. Josh and his wife, Jenna, used to be yoga studio owners of a place in Canada, but over the past several years, they've made a new life for themselves and their two kids traveling around, living a nomadic lifestyle. Um, They call themselves the Nomad Yoga Family, and they run a business consulting other yoga studio owners on the insights and lessons that they learned from their time, which is called Nomad Business Coaching. Now, if you are a yoga studio owner yourself or a yogapreneur of any kind, then you can glean a lot from this interview that you can apply to your business right away. Um, But if you're not, this is not an episode to skip over. Josh shares very openly about some personal life-altering events that were quite tragic, but his candor in discussing them and uh, his perspective that he took away from that that has influenced his life since then is something that we can all learn from. On the business side, you can expect to learn from Josh how yoga studio owners and yogapreneurs can flip the script on their aversion to selling and recognize our system of exchange as a positive. He talks about a dual-brained self-auditing system that all yogapreneurs must use to ensure their decisions will serve not only their business, but also their clientele, their students at the highest level. And finally, he explains why getting new students in the door of your studio can't be your main focus and how to win at internal marketing and create staying power for your studio. Josh shares a couple of resources that you can take a look at, Um, lots of gold information here for yoga studio owners and non-studio owners alike. Can't wait for you to check out this episode. Stay tuned through these announcements and we'll dive right into this interview with Josh Biro. New York City yogis. I am very happy to say that my recent workshop at Yoga and Fitness Herald Square on backbending for health and joy was a success. The students were very happy and the studio has decided to bring it back as a three-part series. So if you missed out on the first one or if you did the first one and want to do it again, we are holding backbending for health and joy on October 6th. 20th and November 10th. You can do one or all three. I'd love to see you there. Sign up at henrywins.com slash events. For those of you located elsewhere, I've got some travel dates coming up that I hope you can join me for. On October 11th through 14th, I'm going to be at Original Hot Yoga 305 in Miami, Florida. Then on November 16th through 18th, I'll be in Richmond, Virginia, my hometown, at the Yoga Dojo. The following weekend, November 24th and 25th, I'll be at Hot Yoga Richmond. And for the Miami and Hot Yoga Richmond dates, I'm traveling with my wife, Veronica Lombo. We've got complimentary workshop offerings, and we hope you can make it. Sign up at henrywins.com events. At Lighthouse Yoga School in Brooklyn, New York, we are currently enrolling our next 200-hour teacher training for January 2019. So yoga teachers looking to level up your teaching, aspiring yoga teachers who want to do your first training, or yoga students who just want to take their practice a little bit deeper. You can get more information about that also at henrywins.com slash events. And if you apply now using my referral code, henrywins, you'll save $100 on your tuition. There's no fee to apply, so go ahead, put your application in, drop the referral code, and lock in $100 off. What's your purpose? What's your vision? What mark will you leave on this planet long after you're gone? I'm Henry Winslow, and you're listening to Dharma Talk, the only podcast where I interview inspirational yogis on how they're changing the world in their own unique ways. Whether you're still searching for your purpose or already walking the path, I hope these stories get you excited to live your dharma. 
Hello, Dharma Talk community, and welcome back to another episode. Today, I've got my friend Josh Biro on the line. Josh is the founder of Nomad Business Coaching. After over a decade in the wellness industry, gaining firsthand experience teaching and managing, building and owning yoga studios, Josh started traveling with his wife and children as the Nomad Yoga family. They've been roaming in their RV for two and a half years, and now Josh provides powerful business coaching, best practices, and game-changing studio overhauls internationally. Josh, I'm so excited to have you on. This has been a long time coming. Um, what's going on? Yo, Henry, thanks for having me. I'm super pumped to, uh, to be on the show, to be on the podcast. It's been great listening. Um, well, things are good. good you know, nomadic good. life is, is fun and busy. <laughs> And we were just kind of talking before uh, before we hit the record button, and I know that you are now settling into sort of a new adventure, a new stop along the way, but the nomadic adventures continue whether you take the RV or not. So I know that's a big part of what you're doing and, and what you've dedicated your life, at least at this phase, to. But we always start these interviews with the same first question, so I'll give you a chance to answer that. What does the word dharma mean to you, and what is your dharma as you understand it today? Yeah, um, Dharma is interesting. I think there is no singular English word to actually translate what that would mean for other cultures. But for me, Dharma is kind of like a twofold thing. It's in first, it's like the purpose of existence in general. It's like the way that everything just plays out to be because it's supposed to um, in life. But then I think also on an individual level that we all kind of have our own dharma. And that's sort of like what is our soul or our heart's purpose to fulfill for ourselves that just make us feel fulfilled, really. And um, so it's funny because a long time ago I saw a lady who is a channeler. She's very unique. She's not someone you can look up. She's not someone you can hire. She's not someone you can find even. Like she kind of finds you. Um and we had a, a really incredible conversation for basically a whole day. And she said that, um, you know, my sort of life's, life's purpose is to give and receive love. And I don't know. It's a simplistic way to word it. But for me, I think that would be my dharma. That's, that's really what it is, is to sort of um, participate in giving and receiving, you know, with everything and everyone around me. And that's when I'm living that way. That's certainly when I'm the happiest. So, mm-hmm. yeah. That's what my dharma is, I think, right now. Yeah, and, and you know, I think the way that she put it, yes, it's simplistic in a way that can really apply to anyone, but the way that you interpret that and the way that you um, execute on that, you know, is, is really what makes it unique to you, to go back to kind of your your definition of dharma being a twofold, um, twofold thing, this thing that's universal and this thing that's deeply, deeply personal. So, you know, what are you, what are you doing? Tell us a little bit about um, where you've landed right now and how you got there and, and along the way how you've given and received love in that journey. Yeah, well, I'm not sure how far back to go. So when I was born, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> so, um, I'll, give the, I'll give the brief, you know, overview of the whole thing, but I think we've got to go back to sort of a, a life event that we don't always talk about, but it seems appropriate for your podcast that um, my wife and I, you know, we have two kids, but we had a third kid in between, and we were always travelers. She traveled often, like, or quite a bit by herself, so did I. We traveled together quite a bit, and what's funny is years ago when we were, like, because we met when I was, like, 14, um, even when we were that young, we used to joke about getting in a car and, like, driving to Mexico and just the romance of the whole of the whole thing. So I think becoming nomads was always in our in our destiny of some sort. So we were traveling with our kids and um, long story short, we were in like a freak rock fall accident and uh, a rock hit us and crushed our daughter and she died. So that event, the reason I bring it up is it was not that it didn't change anything about us, I don't think. But what it did was it amplified existent belief systems we already had. And the big one was just that regardless of your belief, like the only moment that exists is the moment of right now. And if you look at it that way, it means you can take action to kind of be in the situation that you want to be in. And it's sort of what you're doing. 
um, at any moment in time, but you have to make that decision. So that sort of amplified that belief for us. And the result was we realized we were super happy with our situation, but we were ready to do something else. And there were lots of rational reasons not to do <laughs> what we ended up doing, uh, which we'll get to in a half a second, but that was no longer relevant. So, you know, that life event was something that I think was actually, I, I can see the sort of silver lining in the whole thing, um, despite the intensity and the sort of sorrow that surrounds it. So the result was we sold everything we owned. We sold our house, we sold our vehicles, we sold our business. We literally had like 20 garage sales. In Canada, we used Kijiji instead of Craigslist mostly. Um, I, I could totally teach anybody a course on how to use Kijiji properly at this point. <laughs> um, you know, and we unloaded everything and we moved into an Earth Roamer, which is uh, like a four by four RV. And um, then we went traveling and we've been traveling for almost three years straight now, nonstop. And uh, so we did all of all of Canada. We did the whole West Coast of the United States, did all of Mexico, like literally all of it. Guatemala came back up, did the East Coast of the States, back down. And now we're in Sayulita, Mexico, just north of Puerto Vallarta. And um, <clears throat> part of the trip was kind of because, you know, we wanted to travel, but we also wanted to just be open to see what comes up, like what opportunities will come to us on their own. So a recent opportunity that's been really cool was a gentleman has handed his micro hotel off to us. So we have the Sayulita Surf Hotel or Casa Buena Onda. They have two names. I don't know why, but that's what it does. <laughs> um, it's just like a three room hotel that we run. So now we're going to live in Mexico primarily. So we live here. I rent an office at a work share um, to work. And uh, yeah, there's an international school for our kids. We can go surfing every day, which is pretty cool. International airport, really close. So I'm still I'm still quite nomadic. I mean, I'm going to be teaching at Mind Body Bold um, in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be doing a couple overhauls at studios um, over North America in the next little while. So the nomad isn't out of there. We're just not traveling the truck now at this point. And the thing that we've been doing, so the exciting part, you know, from a yoga perspective is we owned, our business was a, a large yoga studio and we helped build a couple other yoga studios. So when we sold that, we started helping out at some studios and organically, I sort of um, ended up building Nomad Business Coaching because we'd always talk business with studio owners. So now I work with people all over the place. We've got clients that we're working with in Australia, Canada, the United States, Mexico, Netherlands, Germany, England. Um, yeah, so it's been really kind of cool because we've had the unique opportunity to be like a, a manager of a studio, a builder of a studio, an owner of a studio, selling a studio, teaching at multiple studios, traveling. We've been to over like 150 studios in the last year and a half now. Um, and then working with people as well online, sort of internationally. So we're like, we've kind of dove deep into the industry and seeing what's going on, especially on the business side of things. And um, I'm trying to contemplate all the time, you know, what's what's working and what's not, and 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 what are the best practices for the modern yoga studio, yoga teacher, yogapreneur sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just have to say when you told that story, my heart just sank. I did not know that about you, Josh. And I really commend you for opening up and being willing to talk about something that was, you know, so tragic, but at the same time, uh, so pivotal for you. So thank you. You know, thanks for, sh for sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think sharing those things, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I think sharing those things is something that, uh, it's important, not just for someone who's experienced that, but just like that's part of life. You know, these these right. life happens to you and some shit's going to happen. There is no doubt about that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's a good idea to just talk about it candidly, I think. So, yeah, I'm happy to I'm happy to bring it up. Yeah. And I also appreciate that you were able to see what that kind of what the impact of that event was on your life and how it kind of changed your perspective on everything. Because it seems to me, you know, from an outside perspective, looking at you and the life that you've created for yourself and your family, that being so focused on what is here and what is right now has made you, in a way, um, this like connection to the present moment has given you an omnipresence in terms of place. You're no longer rooted to any one place because you're so focused on being here in, in time, which is a really cool um, connection to make. 
Yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. We're super normal people in that I'm still thinking about what are we doing next week, next year, five years from now, or this thing happened before, but like, you know, you're still, or maybe we should buy a house or all the normal thoughts anyone has are still there. Yeah. Um, I think just we figured out for us how it can work for us to not be physically sort of stuck in one spot because that's the choice that we enjoy right now. That's the only other thing I would say is I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that our lifestyle is something that everyone would want to live either. But yeah, um, yeah. for us, it's what we enjoy right now. So, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, of course, we all have those those regular mental thought patterns about, okay, what's coming up? What do I need to plan for? But at the same time, you're making big decisions based on a framework that you've been consciously um, putting in work into into practice, which is like, let me, let me create um, – some surrender in my life so that new opportunities can come in that I'm not planning for. And you know, you never would have landed at this new three person hotel, this three room hotel and had this opportunity. Had you said, okay, I'm going to be the yoga studio business guy. That's my thing. That's the only thing I'm focused on. So, I mean, I think that's really cool and inspiring for a lot of people who one know exactly in their mind, quote unquote, know exactly where they're going and people who don't necessarily. It's like, give it up. Find out what can land in front of you and see if you want to run with that. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's funny because this this totally ties into conversations that I have when I'm training sales staff at a yoga studio even. We talk often about how the human mind is built in this way that we make all of our purchasing decisions from an emotional place first. And then we use rationale to back it up. Hmm. But that sales situation is something that we know very well because we do it with ourselves all the time. So we're always selling ourselves an idea. You know, our conscious mind and our unconscious mind are not always necessarily on the same page. It's when you get them on the same page that things really awesome happen. And I can say honestly that, you know, some of the coolest, best, funnest things that I've ever done in my life have not necessarily been the most rationally sane ones. (laughs) So, Uh you know, um, not that those decisions aren't always good too, but just I think we can get really caught up in thinking about like almost overthinking it, almost thinking too hard about I want to do this and I've got to focus and I've got to grind and I've got to hustle and I've got to, you know, stay, stay on this straight and narrow um, to work towards this singular goal. And in doing that, we put the horse blinders on a little bit. So it's yeah. not that there's no value in that or that you don't have to learn that skill set as well. It's just that you don't want that to be the all end all either. I think that both there's, there's space for both. Totally. And to come back to your point about connecting the subconscious or emotional mind with the rational thinking mind. I mean, for me, that's, that's what meditation is all about. I know that there's a lot of gold down in there in the subconscious mind that I just want to tap into and meditation helps me with that. Josh, I'm really curious, you know, especially with your lifestyle moving around constantly, what does your yoga practice look like and and how are you using that to support yourself, feed yourself, and then be able to give that information and learning to all of your clients and friends and loved ones? Yeah. Okay. Well, first off, <clears throat> that's a bigger question than I think the words entail because first you have to say, what is yoga? So, I mean, usually what we're talking about is what is your asana practice or meditation or, or pranayama practice look like? But I mean, the one thing I learned really early on is that everything is yoga. Like if you're really practicing yoga, you're like living in a yogic way. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm always practicing yoga. <laughs> I mean, you know, and when when things get tough or when I get tired or when I lose focus, like that's when I try to hone in on just these simple mantras for myself um, that empower me to sort of stay more on the ball. Um, but physical yoga practice and meditation yoga practice and those things, traveling has been an adjustment, honestly, because it's weird when you travel, like if you fly somewhere and then you go and try to do a yoga practice, that class is, is it helps you feel better in that moment. But you know, it's not usually the class that you feel the most amped in or the most flexible or the strongest or, or whatever. So, um, so traveling, I feel like my practice has become way more of a maintenance practice than it was in the past. It's more about me maintaining general health, not getting sick, maintaining good feel like if I'm sitting working I might do four or five or six calls in a day you know that's a lot of hours of sitting (laughs) all of a sudden which I don't naturally calibrate 
play too well. I don't think anyone have to do something after you got to, you know, do some yoga practice after that just to keep your spine and your hips and your body feeling okay as well. Yeah. So, um, and then also environment has been an interesting thing. I feel like, um, the environment is a large component to a yoga practice and I'm not sure that people always notice that. So I like practicing hot yoga personally because I'm a stiff dude and the heat helps me move easier and I feel like I get a lot out of it personally. Um, but when I'm in Mexico, like you don't really need a hot studio. It's hot and humid here anyways. So you, you know, you do a nice Ashtanga class or just any flow class here and like you are sweating and you are hot, you know, it's no problem. Then we travel back to Canada and it's cold. <laughs> so if the room, if someone's not turning the dial up in the room at least a little bit, um, I, I can do an entire hour practice and feel like I'm just really getting warm by the end. So I've been surprised traveling how we have to change where we practice a little bit or recalibrate to where we practice slightly based on the environment of wherever we are physically. Oh yeah, totally. Um, that reminds me of, uh, Kino McGregor was talking about how people ask her, you know, she's got an Ashtanga Shala in Miami and people ask her, is this who aren't familiar with the practice or the lineage, whatever they say, is this hot yoga? And she says, well, I mean, you know, here we actually sometimes have to turn down the heat to get it to around 80, but you're hot. If I go and do my practice up in Scandinavia or wherever I'm traveling next, yeah, they got to turn the heat up. So it really yeah. does depend on the environment. It's true, but we can bring a certain amount of that environment to the practice from internal too. So, um, it is a mix. It's totally a mix. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the one thing I can say is it, it, the, Anyone who practices with any level of regularity, or even if you don't, if you're new to your yoga practice too, the test is simple. When you feel the worst, I don't mean like hungover, I mean like you've been driving all day or you're stiff mm -hmm. or you feel a little bit sick or whatever, just go in your living room and just do do five vinyasas with good ujjayi breath or just do like really good hot yoga style pranayam or do do the half moon series in the, from the Bikram series, you know, and that's it. And it only takes like 10 minutes and then ask yourself, do I feel better or worse afterwards? And there's no chance that you feel worse. You always feel better. So yeah. there is that element, like you say, that we're affecting the body when we do asana practice from a very core level out. I always explain it like we're working the body from the inside out versus fitness is primarily outside in. And that approach is fundamentally different for a reason. Um, so one of them is just when we're talking about decompressive nature in the body, creating heat in the body, getting things moving, sort of massaging the organs, getting good synovial and blood flow moving. Um, that's where the yoga practice is just so absolutely ingenious. Mm -hmm. You know, you're um, an amazing yoga teacher. I know that people talk about you and you had a very successful studio when you were running your own. Um, but you're also an expert in the business side. And I'd love to be able to give some of our listeners who are in that position to benefit from that, a little glimpse of some of the, the knowledge that you can, you can share. Um, yeah. and, and what made me think of it honestly is this parallel between the practice of yoga and, and the business of it. I mean, we can make a lot of change from the outside in, but the best work, the best results come from working from the inside out. Um, is there any, can you, can you draw that connection back to working inside a yoga studio business? 100%, especially right now, 2018, moving into 2019, especially now, that is the best parallel you could possibly, um, draw for sure. So, I mean, the first thing I'll mention that's really fascinating traveling around, um, and looking at yoga business on every level. So like there's the individual sort of yoga preneur, yoga teacher, there's the, people who have like their own studio and the studio owners. There's the people who have some sort of a yoga business like workshops or traveling that way. Like there's a, there's a few different levels, but they all have certain similarities and difficulty. The first major component that we experience a lot, which is surprising just because it seems like old news now is really around compensation. And when you had, uh, Aaron Rose Vaughn on, she made this comment too, that like she had to, come to terms with the fact that she's not actually taking care of herself and doing her yoga practice if she's not willing to receive financial compensation for offering a service to somebody. Mm -hmm. So at, at its core to begin with, yoga teachers especially, and then yoga studio owners, 
have to flip the script on their opinion of money and receiving from people. You know, money's just the system of exchange. It's completely inanimate. It's just a way simpler system than saying, I'll trade you, you know, four loaves of bread for this yoga class kind of thing. <laughs> so it has to be there. And in fact, you need to take money from people who are offering it to you for your yoga service so that you are being respectful to them. Um, plus, you also have to eat and keep your lights on and, and operate. So yeah, eating's good. The, there's this, yeah. So there's this weird thing in the yoga world and I really only experience it because when I work with people outside of the yoga specific industry and we're looking at like fitness and stuff, this immediately disappears. It's oh, only really in the yoga world that there's any, yeah, there's, it's only here that we ever have this experience of people being like, they feel like there's something a little reluctant or they don't want to sell their product, you know, or they feel like yoga shouldn't be a business. I've actually heard you know, really incredible teachers straight up say that, like we shouldn't even char charge for yoga. And to me, it's just the most insane thing. I mean, get with the times. Did that happen in the past in India? Yeah, sure. Does it happen now? Sure does. But that doesn't mean there's anything negative about it. You know, it's just, we're going through a change of systemics worldwide in a lot of things. And yoga is not outside of that. So right now, that system of exchange, I think coming to terms with that and looking at it as a very positive thing, that's it sounds simple, but like that's fundamentally this one thing that if if you can come to terms with, I think already you have more success. Mm -hmm. But the extension of that, when we're looking at what you're saying, Henry, when we're talking about like the parallel between inside out versus outside in is stepping back and getting the larger perspective about what you're doing, because it's also possible to get too caught up in the business side of things and not really know what to do. And then you're making decisions based on your business brain, I would call it only and not based on your yoga brain. And if you have these two brains or yoga brain and your business brain, your decision process should be that you can reconcile whatever it is you're doing with both of them should be smart business move, but also ethically, morally part of your sort of yoga, yoga belief system. So you got to run um, it through the test on both sides. And if it passes on both, then you're good to go. Right. If you can double check it, it's like a good idea. You should definitely do it. If it's only business, maybe you still do it, but you should seriously audit it. If it's only yoga, same thing though. You know, mm -hmm. you should seriously audit it and just decide like, is it okay that this is just a yoga only decision <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, but even further than that, the big thing about 2018, 2019 and what we're seeing in terms of what's working best practice wise, but also what just makes sense for humanity is the fact that the business is the way we facilitate delivering a helpful product to the people who are looking for it and who want it. Businesses are our system of delivery right now. And I wholeheartedly believe that business leadership is gonna be the most important leadership of the next decades of time. And Sadhguru from Aisha Center talks about this often. Mm -hmm. And you know the best examples right now are like, if we look back a decade ago, the electric car was dead, solar wasn't like a viable option, batteries weren't strong enough to hold anything for storing power, so like that was like a dreamland. One dude with some balls and some money has kind of swung that around, right? Like with Tesla Motors and with with SpaceX, like it, that was a business that made that happen. That wasn't a grassroots uprising, that wasn't voting in the right law, that wasn't putting the right person you know, in government, mm -hmm. that was a business. And yeah, I and think that on the it, micro level, go ahead. I was just going to say, Elon Musk is like, he's tackling issues that have traditionally only been reserved for the state because they're so major in scale. So yeah, I mean, even more to your point. Exactly, exactly. So I mean, businesses just, they have a certain mobility and a certain ability to deliver based on based on, you know, if we're talking about it from like a weird democratic sort of scope consumer demand that's voting like everything you buy everything you consume everything that you do online everything that you ask for that you're voting for that so it's very democratic to say that businesses they look at what you're asking for and then they deliver it right so that's really why it's so mobile and why it can happen so i think that even on the micro level though if we're looking at like a single mom and pop shop yoga studio in the middle of anywhere 
you know, with a small population, they're still affecting things on that level. They're still like creating this hub for there to be a strong community of people who are connected to themselves. On a deep, I really believe people go into a yoga practice and they literally save their life. I mean, it can be really deep for some people. Other people, yeah. they just get in better shape and don't have to go to the doctors often. That's just as good. You, both are valid. So, you know, that's what these businesses are facilitating. But the scope here is that sometimes the business owners and especially the teachers who are working under the business owners, they don't realize who they're working for and what they're working for. They lose sight of that over time. So when we're looking at like the internal out, it's realizing this level of, of respect that you really necessarily have to start to employ when you're approaching your business. And the best example of this, and Kino actually is a good example of this because of her you know, online presence and her TV and everything else where if you, you can take Kino's yoga class like right now in your living room. Yep. So if, you, and I, if, I, just, if I just wanna do some stretching postures, I can go on YouTube for free right now and do any style. You know, I can take Swenson's class. <laughs> so, so <laughs> if that's true, why would I show up to your yoga studio? I have no necessity to go there. And even if I want to go somewhere to do a class that's not in my house, in my living room, I can probably go, especially if you're in the city, to like some local gym or the YMCA and do it for a quarter of the price. So why would I even come? And, and it's just realizing how big it is. If someone gets their ass off their couch and stops eating potato chips, they get their fancy pants on, they find an old yoga mat their dog's been sleeping on, they put you into Google Maps, they drive for half an hour, they get cut off in traffic and someone's flipping them the bird, they find a parking spot, they make it in the doors on time for the one of the four yoga classes that you have. Like, holy shit. You know, you, they don't need to say anything to you. The fact that they walk in tells you they want something more. They want an experience. They want something deeper. They want some help. They're looking for something. So from the business perspective, this is where the internal comes in. When they get there, fucking be ready is the way I would say it. So what is your product? What are you delivering? And how does it differentiate it uh, from the other products that are out there, but also the ability to just do a yoga class somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And that's where there's a lot of other details in the business. You know, yeah. the simplest things, such as how you welcome someone at the studio, can make a massive impact on your retention rate of students, you know? Um, Earlier, yeah. when you said that, um, when you are willing to receive money in exchange for the service of providing yoga uh, out of respect for the student. Is that really what you meant? Like honoring their commitment and their decision to come to you specifically? As well, yeah. yeah. I mean, the two, the two sides to that, like yes, you have to respect them. I mean, here's the thing, if I, you, don't, if I, if you and I have never met and I roll up to you and I say, I wanna buy an, a year yoga membership with you and I'm gonna give you $1,500. You have no idea if that's the only $1,500 I have or if I've got $10 million in the bank. And it's really not relevant because in either case, it's either not a big amount of money to me and I'm willing to spend it or it's every penny I have and I've deemed you and your service so valuable that I'm going to pay you. Mm -hmm. In either case, you need to take that money. Now, that's not the same thing as convincing someone like pushing and old school sales, used car salesman style, you know, trying to weasel that money out of someone. That's a totally different thing. So hear me clearly that that's not what I'm saying to do either. But, you know, that acceptance of that finance um, is really important for that person. It's, it's very empowering for them. Yeah. And also for yourself. I mean, people, yoga teachers especially, are notoriously undercompensated. And for all the yoga teachers out there that think that they get paid bad, try owning a studio. You get paid worse, right? I mean, not all studios, <laughs> but, but there are a ton, and I really do mean this, a ton of yoga studio owners out there that have not paid themselves in years. And, yeah. and their they're yoga doing a lot teachers more work probably, too. and they're doing a ton of work, a ton of work, because it's totally passion project, you know? Yeah. So... I'm not saying that in any sort of like a us versus them way, teachers and owners sort of thing. I'm just saying 
the industry in general has a lot of a lot of situations where people are undercompensated for the value that they're delivering on. Yeah. Josh, can you take us through maybe like one little thought experiment about something that you might be considering for yoga business and how you would take it through the yoga brain and business brain to validate it? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> I mean, sort of an older example that most people don't need convincing of at this point um, is around your pricing. So uh, one of the, the ways, usually yoga studio owners, they open up, or anyone, workshops or whatever, we, we set up our pricing based on what other people are doing. We just like look at the studio down the street and say like, okay, that looks good, and I'll, I'll go a little bit cheaper or a little bit higher, and then we make our pricing, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, or it's however we used to purchase it ourselves. Instead of thinking about our pricing as, no one buys your pricing. Your pricing is the way that you communicate to your people how they should practice based on who they are. So what often happens is we have studios doing things like selling a 30 or a 40 class yoga pass, which ends up being a very discounted rate per class versus a drop in. Mm -hmm. And then they have a, an auto pay membership that is quite expensive. So if a person needs to come like four days a week or five days a week minimum for the auto pay to be the intelligent choice for them to do. So what ends up happening because most people don't practice anywhere near that much, um, what ends up happening is everyone buys like a 30 class pass, which hurts the business actually for a whole list of reasons. But then as well is actually telling that student, you should look at this in terms of single classes instead of in terms of a lifestyle. Uh, and you should spread those out because people naturally, their rational mind will take over at some point. If I buy 10 classes and you say, look, you got six months to use these 10 classes before they expire, most people will try to stretch those 10 classes out over the entirety of the six months. So you just told them, practice 10 classes in six months. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Right? So this is where the yoga brain has to come in because your pricing is very business brain side. But it doesn't mean the yoga brain doesn't have to participate in it. Whereas if you were to say, look, our 10 classes, it's a better rate than the drop-in. But as soon as you come even twice a week, the auto pay is the best option which then sends the message if that person switches to auto pay instead, they have a monthly reminder, hey, get your practice in, because they pay every month. Mm -hmm. They have unlimited flexibility, because they can practice unlimited time. So if this month time allows, and they end up do practicing four or five days a week, like the practice, the whole messaging around it is different. You're saying then, dude, just show up and practice as often as you can, basically. Yeah. And it, breeds more flexibility and what's what's interesting about this is that statistically in the industry right now studios that move towards um you know auto pay dominant membership mm -hmm. do better with cash flow like significantly better with cash flow they don't have that swing in the summer especially any of these studios in the north you know what i'm talking about like the yeah. sun comes out and people are like, peace, you know, and they're gone. Mm -hmm. That kind of doesn't happen as much anymore financially. So it's way more comfortable for the owner. And then the students, the really fascinating thing for us is we're finding that the students who go on auto pay, they practice at a higher frequency and more often over a longer term. So they also actually theoretically have more success because yeah. everything's there for them to do that. So you can feel really good about it as well sort of thing. Yeah, it makes total sense on on both chambers. You know, um, every business wants monthly recurring revenue that they can count on and give themselves like the peace of mind of a pretty um, reliable projection. And then on, on the on the student side, yeah, even if they're thinking with their rational mind, I want to get the the best bang for my buck. I want to bring the cost per class down as much as possible. So that means taking class every single day, and then. Swinging it back to the business side, I think when you have a lot of eager, enthusiastic students like that, that just breeds this contagious attitude and you get start getting referrals, you start having the buzz around the studio and that just like, it's a positive feedback loop. You got it, for sure. And I mean, you, you mentioned the energy of the whole thing. That's another good example of sort of the yoga side of things that businesses, all businesses, no matter what business we're talking about, experience this, but they might not be able to define it for themselves. There are a lot of businesses in the yoga world that are doing everything right. They've got good teachers. The studio's clean and nice, set up well. They're teaching a powerful yoga practice. But for some reason, they're having struggles. And 
sometimes when we're on the ground, what you realize is they're just not crossing this line. Like there's no buzz, as you say, this like energetically, it's just a little bit flat mm. and it's probably be not really get that going, <laughs> which might be an event. It might be a pricing change. It might be, you know, having a staff meeting and just being excited. It might be giving people bonuses or a raise. It might be changing the schedule. I mean, there's all sorts of things you could do, but it's just that energetics of a space is really powerful and very attractive. So as you say, when you have a group of practitioners who are devoted and practice regularly, I mean, it's very simple logic. If I have an auto pay membership, that I'm paying every month and I'm practicing regularly at your yoga studio and then I'm at a barbecue and someone says, yo, you're looking good. What are you doing? And I say, I practice yoga. And they say, well, where should I go practice yoga? Am I going to send them to your competition or am I going to tell them where I practice? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like <laughs> it's, it's pretty simple stuff, but that's the one big thing I would note is that there is no, and if you're, if business owners, you know, even yogapreneurs out there, if you're ever seeing stuff that's talking about like this formula or just do this one program or there's just this thing that you do to make your business succeed that you didn't know or whatever, like realize snake oil for being snake oil, you know, it's, mm -hmm. that's BS. What we see in the yoga industry in a very clear way is that it is the accumulation of the smaller things over time that make you win. There is no one single you must do answer. What there is, is having a generalized approach where you think about what are you trying to create? What is the experience you're trying to curate for your students? How can you make them succeed? How you could deliver on value these things? And when you do that and you compound that by all of the little things together, that's how you win. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that too is it's fun. <laughs> like when, you, when you're operating a business, based on your real image, your real why factor, your real like delivery of value, it gets really fun to do. So then it, the stress goes down significantly as well. Yeah, of course, it makes total sense. I mean, you're, you're less, um, you know, mired in all of the, the minutia of oh, why, like, why aren't we hitting the numbers here and there? And you're, you can come back to the reason why you initially started the business in the first place, which is to serve. Right, yeah, well, like you say at the start of the podcast, what's your dharma? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you could look at it on that level. But yeah. what, yeah, what is it that got you, that got you into this in the first place? That's still, you know, you have to, you have to really be willing to self audit and be brutally honest with yourself in a lot of situations in business. Yeah. And the people who get good at that are also the people who are willing to pivot. They're willing to realize the truth that like, they've just like maybe gone a little bit off course from what they really want. And then they pivot and they go back on course. But the other detail of this internal versus external is that right now the game is internal marketing, right? So what do you mean what by that? You, I mean, it's what you do and how you communicate with the students and with the people who show up to you, who are uh -huh. in there. If okay. you want to market to get new students coming in to your workshop, to your business, whatever, you do have to do that. That's true. But if you, let's say let's say for the sake of talking, you're like really good at Instagram advertising, right? You put something out there, you get a whole bunch of clicks on it and people even show up to your physical location to do something great. But now what? Like you got to do something with them when they're there. And that's really where that's how you build that buzz. That's how you build that community. And that's how you definitely capitalize on the finance of things right. because you're never going to make money selling drop-ins and intro passes. That's not the way the business will work. It's always going to be, you know, building strong community of people who are regularly practice. If you build practitioners, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you got to cut the churn and burn and, and start retaining. <clears throat> yeah, retention is kind of the big game. Because the other thing, too, is like if we're talking about getting students to come in and we look at the psychology of the consumer looking at fitness and yoga kind of blends into there, too. The, I mean, they're a bazillion offerings for people and they don't even have to choose anymore if you're in new york or la or any bigger center where there's a lot on it you just go on class pass, class pass and you get yeah, like exactly. a discount you go on a discount discounted rate and you can go everywhere in town yeah. so it's really you know the way that you compete against that sort of stuff is you have to really be doing something internally you know to out compete that on the external mm. marketing on the advertising side is really expensive 
and really energy inefficient. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you don't do it at all, but that's really not where the, the primary focus is. Yeah, that's a really smart insight. Um, Josh, I kind of want to spin the clock back a little bit and hear about how maybe you learned one of these main lessons that you're now teaching people from your time uh, running the studio in Red Deer. Was there a moment where you kind of like really experienced some struggle and then took away a lesson from it that you never forgot? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I think, you know, we were, my wife and I were stereotypical yoga studio owners. So we had, um, we'd been teaching yoga. We were helping manage a studio in Eastern Canada. Uh, we came back out to the West, you know, because we wanted to be near family. Um, we helped a friend build a studio. We helped another friend get their studio set up and going. We were kind of teaching and managing. And then we just saved every nickel and dime we could. And I took my inheritance from my mom and we went to the banks and got finance to build our own studio. So then our thought was, if we can just get open and teach, we'll just teach every class and I'll even get a second job, you know, it'll just, it'll be great. <laughs> and we'll, we'll just teach yoga and everyone will be happy because they're doing yoga. Like it was very, very, very much a passion project. Uh -huh. But what was interesting was that's not actually what happened. When we opened our doors, we had nothing. I mean, we, we had gone way gone over our budget and luckily, um, you know, had the means to kind of get rescued by getting our banks to give us some more money and went into more debt. And, but we didn't even have cash flow to start. Yeah. And there were only the two of us. And we were in an area where there were like 10 other yoga studios. So we had lost competition, but no yoga teachers um, of the lineage we were in. We were uh, doing Bikram yoga at the time. So I don't know. We were like really between a rock and a hard place. And we had our, our son like the week before. <laughs> so we would we would open the doors and like put our son in his little bassinet on the desk and sign the class in and then play rock, paper, scissors to see who would go teach. And that was cool, you know, and exciting that we did that. But then we started getting busy. So then all of a sudden, we, you know, more people were coming and, and we're like, I can't I can't keep up at this. At some point, we're going to run out of steam and it's going to put our personal relationship and other things, you know, on the line. And that's not that wouldn't be living our own yoga. So what I realized was the big eye opener for me was, and I think that most yoga studio owners have experienced this. We get stuck because of this passion play working in our business all the time. And we never take a minute to step out and work on our business because it's a lot of effort to get open. But then past that point, there's very little time that we spend proportionately working on our business. And as soon as I realized like there's no way that we're going to ever scale this thing or be able to be really, really happy with the situation if we just keep working in it. I have to start working on it. Mm. And so then we did. We just prioritized that. And we took the gamble of hiring people before we even had the money for them. And I went through business coaching myself and mentorship programs and studied my ass off on everything I could and used all my knowledge from previous, you know, small businesses that were totally unrelated um, and started trying to really look at, you know, what we could do to succeed and building a team around that. So just that fundamental shift in the mind that like you've got to work on your business. And the result was everything worked out very, very well. We had a very successful studio. Um, <clears throat> so how yeah, are so you able, the, how are you able to, um, to take those steps? It's sort of like a chicken and the egg problem, right? Like how are you able to start acting like, an owner rather than an operator before you had the cash flow to do it. Yeah, I mean, some this is where that self auditing comes in, and I have experienced this as well. It's the one of the challenging conversations that I have when I'm working with owners one on one in my mentorship programs. It's like we'll tell people like you've got this many hours in the day, you have morning classes and the afternoon classes, and then that gap in the middle, your kids are at school, nothing else is going on at the studio, like. What are you doing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You, if you are tired, you need to go have a nap. Fine. But, but if you need a little siesta or something, that's fine. But like there's, there is time there. That's the big excuse right now. I don't have time I'm busy doing this. I'm busy doing that. So realize that there is time available. It's how you prioritize the time. That's the big difference. Yeah. So it's realizing that during that time you can go and clean stuff or whatever else, or 
figure it out. Like find, get a karma cleaner, get someone paid a small amount of high school student to help with that stuff and then start working on your business and just actually do it. Um, so how do we transition that gap? Like you just, you do it a little bit slow at the start, but you do it yourself. You start just taking control of And the best, the best example of this would be like hiring someone to run the front desk at your yoga studio. For some studios, it's not necessary um, or they don't do it. But for most studios, they don't think it's necessary. And their concern is that they won't get a return on that investment. If you pay someone, you know, two, three thousand dollars a month on the high end to be at the front desk of your yoga studio, you think that's an expense going out. But then you have a singular or to trained staff member who you are going to work with to perfect their sales process and to offer an elite level of customer service. Mm -hmm. Of course, people are going to want to be around that. Of course, they're going to close more sales. Of course, your conversion is going to go up. So you can't look at it that way. You've got to look at it like when you're not there, you have that other person backing up the whole system. You're going to 10x any expense on that person easily if you actually train them and actually put a process in place for them. You know, yeah, not to mention all the time that that frees up for you to be devoting to more, um, more, I guess, uh, valuable, uh, right. uses of your time. Right. Exactly. And that's just the point. So how do you do that? You, you just do it. You just realize that like, you've got to self audit and then you've got to be like, am I prioritizing my time? What can I, what do I need to actually spend my time on right now? Like, do I need to get caught up in this mundane silly stuff or can I work on something more important? And then additional to that, realize the situation and the truth of it. In this moment in time, am I held back by something? And whatever that is that's holding you back, fix it. You know, it might be, a, it might be the simplest thing. I mean, the, one of the greatest <laughs> examples right now is using mind-body and constant contact. Mind-body is, I don't, people can debate this point all day and their pricing has gone up and people are upset about it and stuff like that. But the bottom line is it still does the largest number of things for a yoga studio period. And secondarily, it has the largest number of integrations. So for example, if you're using constant contact to send your emails, they, the constant contact can't really do anything for you. If you're my butt, like all you can do is send a newsletter with it mm -hmm. and you're paying probably a hundred bucks a month for it. Whereas if you want to send better curated messages, but you want to do it at a higher frequency, you need to automate. So get rid of constant contact. There's a program called Brandbot right now, which I'm in love with because they just, it works and it, it's awesome what it does. And it integrates directly with mine, with my body. So, you know, switch that up and then you, yes, you got to spend the time curating those emails and that experience. But then after it's set up, this is also the time that we're living in. It's automated. You just push go and that stuff's going, you know? So the experience for your based, clientele. It's like triggered based on specific actions that your, your clientele are taking exactly. or, or when their packages are running out. Exactly. So a really, you know, the, the easy example would be someone goes on your intro pass, you sell them a 30 day intro. What are you doing with them for that 30 days? Sending them an email twice is not enough. And your staff is probably going to miss them at the front desk unless you train them really well on it. So I would recommend that you're contacting them a minimum of 10 points at this point in time, like way more contact. Because the other thing to be clear is they're still a prospect when they're on your intro. They're not a customer yet mm -hmm. until they've converted over. So you need to take advantage of that opportunity. And with something like Brambot as the example that we're using – you can say, okay, someone who buys this intro, send them this email. If after a week they've done three classes, send them this one. If they've done less than three, send them this one. Towards the end, send them these information about this and this and this and this based on these parameters. You know, cool. based on the time, based on their visits, based on their previous purchases. And that's super where it gets really cool. It is, and it sounds super complicated, you know, as well. But once it's set up, that's the thing is it's automated and you get to just think and, and really put your passion from your product into these things to raise the bar of quality that you're delivering to the people who are there in your studio. That's that internal marketing again. Right. You know, this is all part of that. That's right. curating that experience for them. And then even if you don't convert, then they, you've set the bar for what an experience should be at a good yoga studio. They go somewhere mm -hmm. else, they end up coming back in a month. Right, right. Like, hey, that was so, pretty good. <laughs> 
Right, right. right. These guys sent me this cool video and told me how to do this and gave me a tips and trick thing and they phoned me to see how I was doing and I got a friendly text message or whatever. Yeah. Um, Whereas the other studio didn't even tour me around. You know, they smiled. Like they didn't even know I exist. Yeah. And that was it. Right. They they basically just told me like, I don't give a shit. (laughs) Right. Yeah. That's what they didn't say. You know, Um, that's a really good recommendation. Love that. I'll drop the, a link to brand bot on the show notes of this episode. Um, so anyone who wants to check that out can, can click through there. Um, Josh, you know, thank you so much for, for dropping some knowledge bombs there, sharing a little bit of your expertise. Um, we'll also have links to how they can get in touch with you too. But um, before we move yeah. on to the prana round, just want to ask you, apart from getting your message out on the podcast today, wh- what are you doing to live your dharma? And they've got a whole new change of scenery. So what's up today? Yeah, so, I mean, for me... Family is always, you know, such an important component. Um, so we've got our family in a place where we feel like safe and we're excited about what we're doing in our lives. And we've got like cool schools that our kids are going to to learn another language. And then also they're very internationally based or so experiencing that. So I think that's the big thing is, you know, as a family, putting ourselves in a situation and living in a way that we're all collectively really excited about and happy with. And then on a personal level and on a business level, I just, I can't even believe it's been a surprise to myself that like, I love working with these studio owners on their businesses because when they succeed, like that's the payback for me. You know, it's not that I do something special. We just, they get to have an outside perspective. We put some proven best practices in place. We contemplate what the best move is for them. I help them do it. They do it. And then the win is people show up and their business starts to kill it, not just financially, but like it has that buzz. It has that community. People are talking about it. You know, it has a presence. And some of them that we've worked with, I mean, we've got a couple studios uh, right now that we're working with that like they've seen like literally 100% increase in their attendance versus the last year. They've like wow. doubled their attendance. Yeah. And that's incredible. That's not always the case, of course. But like when you see that sort of stuff, it's so epic and it just makes you so happy because you know that all those people that are going in there are having this really awesome experience. So I love seeing that success. I feel like it's my ability to give, you know, and to help in the larger community to ultimately get to the people being able to really, you know, get into a yoga practice and experience something that's very, very powerful for their, their well being overall. Totally. It's that ripple effect. You know, the more people you can reach with this stuff, the more they can share the yoga and, and really get people to develop a practice. And that's, that's what it's all about. I love it. You got it. All right, Josh, you ready for the prana round? I know you're a listener of the show, so you know the rules. But I'll just say it again <laughs> for, for the listeners. This is where I ask you six rapid-fire questions and ask you to answer minimum one word, maximum one sentence. All good? Okay. I think all I can right. do it. <laughs> okay. All right. In one word, why do you practice yoga? Health. What is your favorite yoga pose and why? Ooh. Um, I've got to say backward bending, like standing backward bending. Nice. Because I don't, it just feels insane. Like, insane and, is the word for it. I don't yeah. know, good, bad, all, but it's, it's insane always. <laughs> <laughs> What's the single best cue or piece of advice you've ever received from a yoga teacher? <clears throat> hmm. Or the first good one that comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, the best thing I've heard from a yoga teacher is just don't get caught up in the minutia. Like don't, don't don't let yourself get caught up. Yeah, don't let yourself get caught up in the little details of overanalyzing. Just just do it. Take action and then mm-hmm. contemplate the result. <laughs> yeah, stay in the broader perspective. All right, yeah. recommend one book, either modern or ancient, for our audience. Oh my gosh. I mean, I have to cheat on this one and go easy and just say, if you haven't read um, a few, you've got to read like two or three translations of the Bhagavad Gita. You have mm-hmm. to do it. Yep. You do. It's a requirement. <laughs> it's a requirement. It's just even if you don't uh, subscribe to yoga on any level, it's still you still have to read it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, is yoga for everyone? Yes. How can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you in your Dharma? Yeah. Um, so nomad business coaching is my website. I'm also on Facebook posting stuff there all the time. And, uh, the family page is nomad yoga family. So you can check us out in either of those. We're on all the standard social media channels. Definitely follow us, uh, you know, on social media cause we're trying to keep that active and fun. And, um, Send me a note. For the business side of things, I do a free growth strategy session for one hour with anybody. So you go to my website, find the scheduler on there, schedule yourself in. All we do is talk about your business. It's not a salesy thing at all. It's just try to give you some tips and tricks and see if it works that we are a good fit together or not. Right on. That's uh, super generous of you to share your time like that. And I know there will be some people who take you up on it. Uh, Sweet. Josh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in uh, in Mexico in in a couple months for one yeah. fire. So, one uh, fire fest. It's going to be one good. One fire fest, baby. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show and and sharing. You know, not holding back with the tips. Uh, I know it's going to hit home with a lot of people. Um, maybe not always in the most easy uh, easy to swallow way, but you know, you gotta <laughs> you gotta take that stuff and and really take a look at yourself and what you're doing. So thank you again for sharing. Um, and we'll talk soon. Thanks again, Henry. And I really appreciate, you know, the work that you're doing with this show and stuff. I think it's great. So yeah, thanks for having me. If you got something out of this episode, if you like Dharma Talk and want to keep it going, please do me a huge favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. I know it's not the most convenient thing to do, but it makes all the difference in getting the show out there and more visible to other people who can benefit from it. And hey, if you've got feedback or ideas or you want to get in touch with me, you can do that on Instagram at Henry Wins. Otherwise, I'll talk to you next week. And until then, keep living your dharma.